You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Uh, well, it's not such a nice story for me, so I don't really like talking about it all that much. I don't have a rosy, happy picture to tell you. Uh, I started at three, and I've worked ever since. I was a slave. That's all you need to know. I mean, when you're working on a movie with Steven Spielberg and the director of Superman, how could you possibly not be in a huge movie? See, the song Stand By Me, why weren't you in the film, the, the, the music video? Because I was a little busy working on a little movie called Lost Boy. Everybody in the world knows that it's true, but the media doesn't want you to believe it. You know, they want you to believe that it's, that it's me being crazy. That's what they'd have you believe. That's why they painted that picture for so many years. But unfortunately, when somebody sits there and makes one accurate prediction after another, and say, this, 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 and this is going to happen, and it actually happens, then you have to kind of look at yourself and go, who's the crazy one? Uh, boom, we're on. Like, first and foremost, Corey, how are you, brother? Uh, doing all right. I'm doing all right. We're excited to get ready for the tour. We've been rehearsing our butts off every day, all day long. Rehearsals, no fresh air, no time to breathe, no time to uh, relax or do anything outside of this rehearsal room that we're in right now. You can't see it because I've got my lovely artwork posted behind me for my new box set. But we have been working away in this rehearsal space and... uh, it's been intense, man, but I'm ready. I'm ready. We're almost there. Another week and a half of rehearsal, and we will be ready to rock and roll for the world. So Good stuff, mate. It looks great. Yeah, it looks great. Thanks. But Corey Feldman, massive name in the 80s, 90s, blockbuster film, still getting watched to this day. Stand by me, The Goonies, Gremlins, The Lost Boys, like unbelievable films, like unbelievable actor. A pleasure to have you on the show. Um, you're Thank a man you. Who- who doesn't really mix his words either you've you've stepped to the forefront and trying to expose big names to not just protect yourself and heal yourself but other kids from going through some of the stuff that you've went through but right. Corey I always go back to the start of my guest brother where yeah. you grew up and how it all began uh, well it's not such a nice story for me so I don't really like talking about it all that much I don't have a rosy happy picture to tell you uh, I started at three and I've worked ever since I was a slave. That's all you need to know. <laughs> from, three, from three years old? Yeah. What was the first memory of acting for yourself? Can uh, you remember? It's, it's in my book. It's in my book. Read my book, Choreography. It's all in there. Where can we Let's get your book? About it, you can get it anywhere. You can get it online. You can get it at bookstores, hopefully still. Barnes and Noble. Uh, but there's also a great audio version for anybody that doesn't want to be reading and is a bit too lazy to read and be bothered uh you can actually just put it on in the background you know and drive to it or whatever and i actually narrate it myself so you can actually get a, a good deal of uh, amusement i think out of listening to it as i i tend to do all the voices and all of that for everybody so you know it's kind of listening to conversations in a way and there's a bit of music in there as well we threw a bit of uh ascension millennia to uh, bring everybody into my world as we open the book so it's a nice audio book yeah, you've well been doing music. yeah you've been doing music for what 30 40 years that's right audible.com by the way you can find it on audible.com but yes i've been doing music for 30 years uh, a little bit over probably about 35 to be exact but that's what the whole box set is about the whole box set is is kind of recognizing for the first time that a a lot of people out there you know have been fans of my films and necessarily weren't following the music side um so for those who don't really realize a lot of people think oh man he's just you know started doing music lately and i remember when we did the today show you know because it was the first time like a billion people heard my music and so like all these people who weren't following who didn't realize how long i'd been doing and said oh well he's just trying to reinvent himself now because his acting career isn't going so well so now he's trying to be cool and be music and be a rock star but the truth of the matter is i was singing before i was acting and a lot of people don't realize that but the way that i used to get my auditions when i was a wee little one 
is I would go on auditions and I would sing because, you know, in those days, at three years old, you can't just pick up a script and read it. And you're certainly not going to memorize the words. So instead, my mom would lock me in a room and she would give me a, a record player and she would say, I want you to learn this record backwards and forwards or you don't come out for dinner, you know? And so I would have to learn it and I would go into an audition. And since I couldn't read lines, what I would do is I would sing and I would sing these kind of little, you know, kind of quirky little songs, little numbers like, uh, you know, junk food junkie or things like that. So I would put on a happy face, just silly little doodad. And I'd go in and I'd sing and that's how I would get the audition. Um, and then after that, my first musical bit was, you know, probably about five years old. I appeared with Dick Matt Dyke uh, on an after school special TV special. It was called How Do You Like a Child? And Dick Van Dyke hosted it. And I was one of the many kids that was singing and dancing alongside him. Um, so that's where the music started. And my father was in a band and um, my sister was in the Mickey Mouse Club. So, I mean, I was certainly surrounded by music my whole life. And in fact, you know, growing up around the rehearsals and, you know, there's a drum kit in the living room and there's speakers and there's cable and wires and feedback and all of that stuff that you hear around a rehearsal stage was kind of always around my living room. So it was very naturalistic. Um, and then I started writing my own stuff probably around 11. But what I was writing then, it was kind of like parodies and joke music. And that's how I kind of learned the process of writing was watching like Weird Al Yankovic videos and matching it to what he did with his parodies. And going, oh, okay, I get it. He's able to kind of use the same phrasing, the same amount of words, the same amount of lines, and that's a verse. And then here's the chorus, and that's how this goes together. So I learned a lot, actually, from, from watching all that. What did you enjoy most, acting or music at a young age? Um, I still enjoy music more, always have. And the reason for that is because it's, it's an expression of self. Many times when you're acting, you're conveying somebody else's interpretation. You're, you're conveying somebody else's dream or somebody else's, you know, wish or, or, or project. Um, but this one right here, this is my wish, my dream. <laughs> uh, but it's true. Uh, is, that from, <laughs> is that from the uh, Goonies? Ah, uh, oh, you're very good, very good. Yes, um, yes. Uh, So anyway, no, no. But, but there is yes. some truth in it, you know, because, I mean, really, when you write music, you're writing your own story. You're writing your own future. You're writing your own past. But as an actor, you're kind of more like a puppet. You're like a robot. You do what they tell you to do. And many times you try to break out of that and give your own creative spin or do your own thing. And the director says, oh, we'll have none of that. You know, we don't want creativity. We want you to do exactly what we want you to do. And you have to do it. So, you know, it's a bit um, a bit more freeing, you know, and certainly a direct contact from your soul to the soul of the audience. Yeah. Do you feel that as if that's why you couldn't enjoy acting because you felt as if it was being forced instead of music where it's more of a passion and you loved it? Yeah, I mean, I do enjoy acting. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's still fun. It's still challenging if I get, you know, a challenging role. Um, but I wouldn't pursue it the way I pursue my music. You know, the music for me is, it's a part of me. It's a piece of me. And although there is a bit of me in every role that I do, you know, um, I prefer it that way. I prefer it to be, I become somebody else and not who I am for that job. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not me and it's not about me. It's about them, or it's about the character that I'm supposed to be. Whereas if I produce and direct the movie myself, or I write the movie and direct the movie, things like that, then that's different because then it's my interpretation of my own story or you know, a character that I'm creating for a purpose. Um, so that's different. I, I can write that in. But as an actor only, solely, it's, it's very limited, really, uh, to your creative freedoms. What age was did you get your first big role? Uh, well, I guess you would say three years old because my very first commercial won a Clio Award and ran for eight years. That's unbelievable, though, the achievements in the films, I think. Did you not have 15 or 16 films that were number one in the box office? 18 number one, actually, so far. We'll see what happens. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable that the Goonies, like I say, my daughter even watches the Goonies because I know she knew she ha I had you on. She was... But see, there's, there's a lot that people don't remember. Obviously, people remember the Goonies who lost boys yeah. and things like that. But it's the ones that you don't remember, like Maverick or National Lampoon's Loaded Weapon or, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number three. You know, there's just these kind of random ones that people forget about, but when you add them all together, that's what makes the 18 number one. Yeah. What was it like making a Goonies? Did you know it was going to be such a big movie, even at a young age? Or did you just of course kind of... we did. No, of course we knew. We knew. <laughs> I mean, when you're working on a movie with Steven Spielberg and the director of Superman, how could you possibly not be in a huge movie? You know, yeah. they wouldn't even give us the script until we got the part. I'd been cast for six months and then wasn't sure, wasn't sure, maybe, maybe. Because, you know, originally Spielberg was directing it, and then they brought in Donner to replace Spielberg because Spielberg stepped aside. He ended up coming back and directing half of it anyway as the second unit director. But the point being, I had to regain the part. I had to re, you know, earn the part from another director after I had already been offered it from Steven. So, you know, I knew I was doing it. I knew it was going to be a huge film. But what I didn't know is that it would last in people's hearts and memories for 35 years. That's a surprise. That's something we didn't realize would still continue to this day. Yeah, we knew it would be big, but how long does big last? In those days, we didn't have much to reflect on. You know, all we knew is that there were very few movies like Wizard of Oz or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or... Um, you know, Three Sturges movies and things like that that lasted for eternity. There weren't a lot of them, but there was a handful that you could say are classics. Now, you know, Casablanca, you know, things like that. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, the, the James Dean movies, Giant, and, and what's the other one? Uh, East to West or something like that. East, East to, I don't know. Anyway, point being, there was like a handful of classics and then there's like the ones that we all know and love. But then there's many, many, many films in between that I thought, oh, well, that one fell by the wayside. So even if they were big, it didn't mean they were going to stick around and be prominent in people's minds. Goonies, we knew it would be big, but we didn't know it would stick around for 85 years. What was Steven, Sp Steven Spielberg like? He was great. Great with yeah. kids. Yeah. Always a good dude. Yeah, he's he's an unbelievable director. Probably the greatest of all time, like from the films yeah, he I mean, and... if, if anything, I'm sad that we didn't stay closer, you know. Um, I mean, I remember Drew Barrymore always stayed very close with him. She would always have these, like, friendly dinners, and, you know, he was like a stepfather to her and stuff. So I feel like Drew ended up having that relationship with Stephen like I had with Dick Donner. Dick Donner was like a stepfather to me. Do you think that you'll, they'll ever make a remake of The Goonies? I hope, sh I hope not. I would sure hate that. Yeah, because you see things like Wally Wonka and you've seen Johnny oh, Depp playing that. Terrible, but it kinda, terrible. Yeah, it kind of destroys that a bit. The classics. Terrible, yes. The like Ghostbusters, Willy Wonka. Whenever they remake them, it's just a nightmare. Sequels, though, I support. You know, they could have, like, made the new sequel and put the Ghostbusters actually in it. That might have been a good idea. You know, like mm. actually have them starring in the film instead of showing up for the last five minutes after we all waited 25 years. But that's a whole other story. Yeah, you look at Top Gun. That's unbelievable right. what that's doing now. Exactly. It's not unbelievable. I know. I know. I try to tell people constantly. Reboots are a waste of time. They're just a, a simple cash grab. That's all they are. Nobody likes them except maybe some new generation of kids that never saw the original. But for everybody else, it's disgusting. It's it's we look down upon it. Whereas a real proper sequel with the real proper cast, because people want to know what happens to those characters 25 years later. Not other people playing those characters, not a future generation of that story, but the actual storyline with the actual characters, with the real people that played those characters, that's what we love as film goers. That's what we want to see. We want to see the continuing adventures of those characters we fell in love with as kids. How was Stand By Me when you done the film? Did you enjoy that? I did. But I'm glad there's no sequel of that one because they'd just yeah, you, ruin it. You couldn't do a sequel of that. How was River Phoenix? Of course Phoenix, not. Was, he a, was he a good kid? Brilliant. Brilliant. 
Did you see the struggle like, when you see people struggling with the young fame? Like, did you see Not that at in all. him? Not at all. Uh, no, no, we got along so you know uh, brilliantly and, and effortlessly, and uh, we'd already been friends anyway. So no, there was there was no damage at that point that I saw, and uh, in fact. He was just a great actor and a great dude, and we got along brilliantly. Um, you know, when when I had heard that he was having trouble and that he was doing heroin, um, I was shocked and I was dismayed and I was I couldn't believe it. And I felt just like I just wanted to save him. I just wanted to help him. And I heard about it after I had just gotten out of the rehab. So I called him up, you know, and I said, Hey, is this true? And he's like, oh, man, what's going on? You know, and I was like, oh, dude, you know. And first he didn't believe it was even me. He sat there and tried to say it wasn't me for, you know, a while. He's like, this isn't Corey Feldman. I was like, yes, it is. He's like, come on. This isn't Corey Feldman. I was like, it's Corey, dude. And then he was finally like, oh, what's up, man? I'm like, what's up? And then I talked to him again. And he's like, yeah, I didn't think that was really you. I was like, yeah, it was really me. So he eventually called back and left a message on my machine. And we were supposed to get together. And then, unfortunately, um, before we had time to get together, he passed. Yeah, that's sad, man. That's such a great future ahead of him. See, the song Stand By Me, why weren't you in the film, the the, the music video? Because I was a little busy working on a little movie called Lost Boy. Yeah, that makes okay. Okay, then, mate. At least you've got a good excuse for it. <laughs> right. I, was, you know I wasn't I mean? sleeping that day. <laughs> Just in case you're thinking, fuck that, that's not going to be big. But what a song that is as well. And you see you see two of the boys from the film in that song. Right, How was because it? River, River yeah. and Will were there. River and Will both li uh, lived in L.A., so it was easy for them to be in the video. But Jerry was in New York, and I was off shooting. So it just wasn't going to happen. Yeah. I know you've probably heard all these questions all the time, but for the UK audience, it's um, always good to go back in time and, and just touch on these things. Like The Lost Boys, another massive film, massive actors that came out from that who are still, who careers are still thriving. Like, how was that film for you also? Oh, it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> do you just look... Do you yeah. just look 35, 35 years ago, man. It's a long time. Do you look Wrong back at it all though, and, and um, kind of sh shows you what you were, what you done, and what you were capable of of being such a great actor, or is it just water off a duck's back now? Same shit. Wow, oh, man, it's just my past. It's just another thing I did. It's like tying my shoes yesterday. It doesn't matter in the least in my life. The only thing that matters in my life is my happiness with my family, my son, my wife, my my dogs and my friends around me, and the love that I bring to the world, and the love that I project, and, you know, continuing that cycle, giving art. I do art for the purpose of enlightenment and enjoyment and, and, and you know, hoping to spread positive enjoyment and positive energy to people because this world is very dark right now, and we need more love than ever, you know, and that's why yeah. I put out this big giant heart box, and we call it Love Left 2.1. My first album came out in 1993, and it featured music from Dream a Little Dream and Dream a Little Dream 2. So what didn't make it to the book, to the first album was all the stuff in, be in between, like the music from Rock and Roll High School Forever, um, a song from Dream a Little Dream, which never made it to the film soundtrack, the music from National Lampoon's Last Resort, all these early soundtracks that I had done which were all promised to have some, you know, big record release party and have a big album out, and single and all this sort of stuff. And it never happened. The only one that actually got a true single was um, uh, Something in Your Eyes, which was on vinyl from Dream a Little Dream, which Michael Damien and I wrote and produced together uh, along with his number one hit from the film Rock On. So we did all that together. And... That song came out, but for whatever reason, it wasn't on the film soundtrack. So for the first time, that song is being made available on both CD and now digitally. We're finally releasing it all digitally. So literally, for the first time ever since those days, since 35 years ago, people can hear my very first song I ever wrote and recorded, which was called Runaway. And then the second song I ever wrote and recorded, which is called Something in Your Eyes, which is with Michael Damien. And then the third song, which is called It's So Simple. And that also ended up on a TV movie of the week, 
with Drew Barrymore and Tatum O'Neill, and it was called 15 and Getting Straight. And we sang that live in the, in the movie. So a bunch of the music that was in my early movies is finally being made available for the very first time ever on digital and CD formats. So that's the big exciting part of this. And then we've taken the original album, which came out in 1993 for Dream a Little Dream 2. It coincided with Dream a Little Dream 2. And uh, that was in 1993. We released it on CD. And now for the first time, we're remixing and remastering all those songs and really sharpening them up. And they sound so crisp and tasty, and like a brand new, fresh breath of air. So that's a very exciting thing. And then on top of all that, we put out uh, a karaoke or choreoke, as we're calling it, uh, CD, which is filled with 14 songs, or I think maybe it's 10 songs, something like that, um, of instrumental versions of my songs the early stuff that people will remember so they can sing along. And we've got lyric videos and all that stuff that comes with it. And then a brand new album with 16 brand new songs, including my new single, Without You, including Comeback King featuring Curtis Young, who's Dr. Gray's son. Uh, Mickey Thomas from Dream a Little Dream came back and did Dream a Little Dream tribute, the Dream a Little Dream 30 track. And so there's a lot of really exciting stuff, a lot of exciting guests, all the people who worked with us throughout the years. Don Dawkin helped put this set together. You remember Dawkin from the 80s? Uh, Lita Ford is on the album. Uh, I mean, so many great people, so many great uh, artists and performers all came back together to do this. So it's very exciting stuff. When are you at your happiest, Cody? Right now. Yeah? <laughs> yes, definitely. I mean, I think as a whole, um, I felt more peace within my heart over the last year than I probably have in a very long time. Just simply because, you know, I feel like I've put the past behind me, you know, and I don't really, that's why I don't choose to focus on it so much because it's all about moving forward, you know. Um, luckily, I've been able to tell my story. Yes, it was stunted and my story wasn't told to the fullest extent because my movie was hijacked, it was stolen. Um, all that stuff went down with the premiere of the film. Um, and that was very traumatic for me. It caused a lot of PTSD. Uh, especially because of all the, the gas writing and BS threats and all the stuff that happened around it, um, just from trying to expose the truth. But as a result of it, um, you know, I went through that pain, I went through that process, and now I've come out the other side. And it's all about looking towards the future for me. Mm -hmm. So we've put out this big giant box of love. It's even got a hologram. You know this? It's yeah, got a yeah, hologram yeah. of me that pops out the top and I dance across. It's pretty cool. Um, and a pair of sunglasses. You get a pair of those Ray-Bans. You know, <laughs> those ones right there. Those right <laughs> there. Those ones. How is it going <laughs> through all that, Corey, like being a, a massive star and then being at the forefront of people then trying to ridicule you? Because a lot of the stuff that you said, people thought you were fucking crazy. And then it turns out the majority of the stuff you've said is true. You see the thing with Weinstein and Epstein and all the people that came forward. How hard was that for you at the start when no one was kind of believing what you were saying? Oh, they're still not. Don't worry about it. I mean, if you listen to the media, that is, I think everybody in the world knows that it's true, but the media doesn't want you to believe it. You know, they want you to believe that it's, that it's me being crazy. That's what they'd have you believe. That's why they painted that picture for so many years. But unfortunately, when somebody sits there and makes one accurate prediction after another, and say, this, 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 and this is going to happen, and it actually happens, then you have to kind of look at yourself and go, who's the crazy one? Ha! <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, is that, is, that mean, is that frustrating, though, when you're trying to help not just get closure? Because you'll never really get closure in your mind if you've been through so much no. torment. But like you say, you're the happiest you've ever been, which is a beautiful thing. But for other people, like, how dark is Hollywood, Corey? Like, how dark is it? Is it so dark to the core that people just turn a blind eye to it or as a good points to it as well of course there's good people you know there's so many people that don't know i didn't know i mean even though i was abused in the system i didn't know how big and how powerful the forces of evil really were i had no idea until i put the truth out and i got attacked in such a massive way they stole you know potentially millions of dollars of profit from us so that's pretty dark, you know, because they wanted so badly to silence us and render me powerless all at the same time. So, yeah, there's that there. But understand, 
that like I went through the business all those years and I would show up every day at work and I didn't realize that there was some dark power behind things. You know, it was, for me, it was just regular job. People are very nice. They're very respectful. They're very polite, always looking out to make sure there's safety on the sets and things like that. So the majority of it seems very fine and very normal. And there's just kind of these dark corners that people don't talk about. You know what I mean? And not everybody's exposed to them. So unless you've been abused or assaulted, you're not going to know that it happens. Or unless you saw something, you're not going to know that it happens. Do you think that's why a lot of people struggle to come forward because of the backlash that they receive? Well, of course, because the first thing that they tell you as a kid when you're, you know, when you're a kid and you have an agent, they'll say, you know, if anything happens on the set, make sure you report it, make sure you report it, tell us everything. So you go, okay, great. And then you try to report something. And then when you go to tell your agent, you can say, okay, well, here's the deal. We hear you. We feel bad that this happened. We'd love to look into it and investigate. But just so you know, if we start an investigation and we report this to SAG, then SAG's going to have to come in and close down the set. And once that happens, they're all going to know that it was you that filed this report. And then your name is going to be trashed throughout the industry because nobody wants to work with the kid that had us shut down, right? So that's what you're told. And I'm sure that's the same thing that women who've been abused are told. And I'm sure it's the same thing that men who have been abused are told. So it's all, you know, shush, 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 don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. And that's the systemic thinking that I've been trying to bring forward for so long. Yeah, because I've had a lot of survivors on, Corey, who would being abused from seven, eight years old and they start to then believe it's their fault. They start to believe that they're in the wrong. And that's the manipulation of the groomers like, to then, like, it's young kids, man. Like, I've got kids myself, so I'm always trying to bring light to these dark stories. They can be painful, especially a man of your own calibre to then, like, it can't be easy to always be talking about it, especially if you're trying to move on. But I feel as if you'll right. probably be, you'll be so talking. So let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for but a lot of people who watch my podcast, Corey, struggle with addiction and stuff. I'm four years clean of drinking drugs myself, but good job, I, I, good job. I understand you're on your own path as well. You had to go to rehab at one point. And I at a young age, how was that going through that change? It was rough. It's never easy, but I made it. And how was the fe feeling when you started getting clean? It was rough, and you know, I mean, it's never easy. Like you know, you know, yeah. you know, why don't you tell us how it was? How was it for you? Yeah, do you know what? It's, it's tough, man. There comes a point in your life where you know something's not right. You know you're being lost. You know you feel as if you're a part of your soul's missing. My life is great now, but I still feel a little empty sometimes. If I'm honest, I always still feel as if there's something a little missing. Like the are you still going to meetings? Yeah, now and again, I was gambling and NA. Oh, that's another one, yeah. Yeah, it was fucking not just Look, it's, one, a, it's, a, it, it's all an external fix to fill the hole inside of you. You know what I mean? We all have some kind of hole, something missing, some empty piece. And when I say all, oh, I don't mean everybody in the world. I mean people who've either been through some form of abuse, whether it's self-abuse or whether it's outside abuse. But we all deal with abuse in our own ways. And many times we have to fill that hole fix that gap with something, something positive that, you know, makes us feel better about ourselves, that kind of relieves us from the pressure, from the pain. And many times it can be food, it can be sex, it can be drugs, it can be alcohol, and it can be gambling. You know, there's lots of things that kind of quench that kind of desire. But in the end, it only quenches it for a moment because in the end, the, the, the pain is always going to rear its ugly head and it's always going to show back up again. Yeah. And therefore, there was only really one solution, and that's our higher power, right? Our higher power is the one that's going to cleanse our souls. We have to have faith in the great divine. And when we have faith in the great divine, we can accomplish anything. But there's got to be a belief system. You've got to believe in something, and you've got to turn your life over to that higher power, and you've got to spend the rest of your life helping others. You know, there'll never be a time where I can just move on. You know, I'm not going to just one day be like, okay, well, now I'm done helping people and I can just be the artist I want to be. It doesn't work that way. You know, God doesn't let that happen because he needs his soldiers, you know, to spread the word, to spread the love. So that's what I continue doing. 
Uh, what's your daily routine like now, Corey? Right now, well, let's see. I wake up at around 11 a.m. and I go get my breakfast. And at 12, we're in the studio working. And we work from 12 to 6 every day, sometimes till 8 or 9, depending on how hard the day is or how much work we have to get done to get it right. Um, and then once the band is done rehearsing, then I spend the rest of the night dealing with phone calls and, you know, contracts and the team and the management and, you know, the transportation and the routing and the merchandise and the video effects and the video screen, the sound stuff that we've got to record and produce for the show, for the soundtrack, for the intros, for this, that, you know, there's so many working parts, the lasers, the lighting, all of it. I do it all. The costumes, getting all the pieces together. So working on a tour is a huge endeavor putting it all together and then on top of it we just now released my my uh music digitally 50 brand new songs coming out digitally under my label well there's only a few of us that work at the label so i'm in charge of all that too um so basically i'm working till two three in the morning every night then i try to spend a little bit of time with my wife and we usually get to bed around 4 a.m and do it all over again non-stop what's harder to make to make a movie or make an album well, I'm making a movie because you're dealing with a lot of other people's time schedules. You know, I can make I can make my albums right here. You know, I sit behind my desk, I've got my studio, my engineer lives with me, and he's also a multi-instrumentalist. So between him and I and my wife, we can pretty much create anything at any time. I've got a drum set and we've got, you know, probably about 40 guitars, you know, guitars, bass guitars, banjo saxophone anything you can think of really we've got at our disposal so you know we sit there all night if we need to and and bang it out but if you're on a, a set obviously you've got you know 200 crew or 300 crew that you're responsible for and you have to make sure they don't go into overtime you have to control that budget blah 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 so you know a tour is equal to a movie that's those two things those two you know are both with many many moving parts and many many you know arms to your octopus i guess you would say um but but for uh for making an album it's much more contained and you know you bring in a guest here you bring in a guest there but you can do those sessions wherever because you can just kind of throw it in you know what i mean like you don't have to produce it um in any sort of order you know there's no like stacking order once you've got the drums and the bass then you can add anything you want at any point even if you think you're done with the song, you can come back a year later, as long as you haven't released it yet, and throw another track on. But for movies, if you want to reshoot a scene, you got to get that whole crew back together. You got to get that whole cast back together. You got to get all the wardrobe, all the props, all the blah, 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 blah. Much harder. Where do you go in the future for your, your music core? It's starting to get noticed now. Like you say, you've been in that industry 